Welcome all. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Odens from the MapTech Sydney office. And this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about the stratigraphic modelling applications in Vulcan Geology Core. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we obviously will be interested to hear any questions you have at the end of the session. There should be a QA box. So feel free to type anything in there. And um, Richard will curate them and ask them at the end of the session. But let's jump in. So hopefully you've seen uh, Richard Jackson's excellent uh, precursor webinars on the um, disseminated modeling, the implicit modeling, and also the vein modeling, covering a lot of some of the basic functionality of geology core. I'm not gonna try and rehash too much of that today. I'll be pointing towards those. We certainly will be touching on some of those um, aspects, but you might've got the impression that geology core was a metalliferous package. Well, from my perspective, you know, where it came from, it certainly was a stratigraphically um, uh, powerful package. So we've inherited a lot of stratigraphic functionality. And from my point of view, I'd like to think of it as being a bit of a stratigraphic package with some metalliferous uh, goodies added on, but perhaps that's just my perception. But the general gist of it is it's the place where you're going to do all your geological modelling and, and, and lead you through that nice, simple workflow process, depending no, no matter what kind of modelling you're trying to do. So we'll spend about half an hour today, uh, a bit of presentation at the start and a live demo at the end. And what we'll cover is Again, briefly, what is Geology Core all about? What do you get out of the box? Uh, the new capabilities as it come with Geology Core itself. Why would you bother? Why change from the way you're doing things now? And at the end, a bit of a, an idea of how Geology Core sort of becomes this central hub of the various MapTech products. Our links to say things like Vulcan, Blast Logic, um, you know, even Evolution. So. What do you get? So if you're familiar at all with the Eureka product, so out of the box with your maintenance dollars, you get a lot of um, functionality that was additional modules, part and parcel of, as, of the core offering. So things like the lithology targeting, where you're using measure while drilling information to pick intervals, the vein modeling and the implicit modeling are both packaged with it as has already been mentioned. The map box interface, um, maybe not so well known, it's a bit like Google Earth, you can bring in a topo, put it in a coordinate system, rubber band where you want, and it'll go and download the latest, latest satellite imagery of that area, and then automatically drape that over your topography. So that's part and parcel of the geology core uh, experience. And of course, the core things, um, drill hole tools, which we'll spend a bit of time having a look at, the coordinate transformation tools, a lot of power in there, grid modeling, obviously, and all the nice surface editing, string editing, undo, redo, um, you know, CAD and, and modeling type tools are part and parcel of what you get out of the box. In addition to that, uh, are a bunch of brand new features. Um, so I guess the primary one is the domain manager. That's, that's the tool where you can take pre-existing logging or downhole geophysics or numeric traces and use that to assign domains or rock types, however you want to think about it, to a, um, a field in your database. Um, and import export has also been made a lot easier. So we've enhanced, you know, although it was initially fairly simple, drag and drop, we've actually put in a whole bunch of wizards to guide the user through that process more, more efficiently. And it can be as simple as if you have Vulcan, load up what you want to bring in in Vulcan, and when you start Geology Core from within Geology menu in Vulcan, it'll give you a tick box saying, do you want to bring across what you've got loaded in Vulcan into Geology Core? So it's very easy to bring data in. If you're familiar with using it uh, from its precursor package, all those options are still available to you as well, obviously. So use it how you want to. Another important addition is the concept of an internal database. So drilling uh, prior to Geology Core was, was a live link to the external database. And that database could be ISIS or CSV files or ODBC connection. What we add as an extra capability is the idea of storing the drilling internal to Geology Core in its backend database. And this means you have a perfect sandbox to do lots of experimentation for your domain modeling and whatever else you're trying to do. It also adds an extra table, which is like a predefined intervals table to model with. And it allows you to do a lot of what if scenarios without touching your back end database at all. Uh, but you can obviously publish to it afterwards. And then the other thing, obviously, is a lot of effort has been put into use Geology Core as a setup program package to get your data in shape to use with the domain MCF tool. 
And so what you can see in this video cycling here hopefully is um, uh, basically the main MCF model, series of models, and these are triangulations that have been spat out from our prototype build of a listological database. So I just took the just the drill holes, listologically logged, used the domain MCF tools to break them down into smaller intervals, set up the extents of the modeling, and through that process to domain MCF, totally untouched. Um, and it's created this model. So all the horizons, splits, sandstone, shales, whatever else, all the different rock types you see modeled there have been done purely by the domain MCF engine with no grid modeling or other types of modeling involved at all. So making that problem and setting up has been made much, much simpler. Why would you bother? You know, I know a lot of people are very familiar with how they do things in Vulcan and, and you, they could make a case to say, oh, well, we can do that in Vulcan, why would we change? Well, predominantly geology core makes life easier for you. It's much more easy and simple to use to set up. There's a lot, much less um, initial setup. Things like legends are created automatically. There's no DG1 extent files, things like that. Uh, you have the ability to bring in, as we'll see, geophysics and whatever very easily. Uh, it's just simpler to use, much more dynamic in terms of editing and viewing. There are also functionalities like the you know, measure while drilling and in, even the domain manager now that aren't really there in Vulcan, the new capabilities. So that's another plus. And it's also a place where you can bring in seismic, you can bring in LIDAR less easily, you can bring in your scans. All that sort of stuff can be brought into the same interface. And if you're doing things like rock mass modeling, you obviously have the database, you have the fields and tables, you can then use implicit modeling to make domains of grade or rock type. You can use the vein modeling to do that, or you can use the domain MCF engine. And why is that relevant to things like stratigraphic modeling? Well, not everything's stratigraphic. You know, you might be trying to model dikes and faults or intrusions that cross cut your coal seams or horizons or whatever the type they are or indeed you're more interested in modeling the actual burden values between the horizons than the horizons themselves. So all that, in addition to the horizons, is available inside Geology Core. So to drill down, pardon the terrible pun, into the drill hole tools a bit more is the ability to, you know, your back ends can be CSV files, it can be ISIS, it can be IDBC connected, as it was before. Very easy to get the data in. And once you've got it in there, viewing, you can basically view the holes very quickly, however you like. You've got beautiful correlation tools. If you have a horizon list file, you bring that in and it will automatically deal with seeing things like seam splits in the visualization. Correlations dynamically change as you change the edits. There's 2D correlation views, as you can see in that lower window here, <clears throat> where it lines things up nicely for you. And you can bring in your traces from geophysics, your traces from quality analyses, your labels, all sorts of things um, very easily, very dynamically. And one of the big pluses from my point of view, I think, is you, if you want to use just a selection of holes, just simply either rubber band the selection, hold down your alt key and pick them, or you know, search within a solid, all sorts of criteria to just get a subset of your data and use that. And it's very easy and simple. You don't have to make any database or anything. And all your modeling work can also be constrained to that subset. So that's, a, again, a really powerful tool. Up the top too, while we're, while we're here, you can see the ribbon concept of the menuing system. So you work from left to right, bring your data in, update, visualize, do some checks, do some stats. You might want to use the domain manager to then pre-populate your uh, the intervals table, correlation, all the stratigraphic capabilities through to modeling, and then finally outputting the data back to Vulcan if that's where you want to go. So you can sort of work your way along these um, intuitive ribbon menus. Litho targeting, so that was uh, recently updated and allows you to do multiple passes, but fundamentally what you're doing is bringing in any numeric type traces, be they ones that are already in your database or associated from downhole geophysics last files, and allow you to pick rock types or domains, if you like, from those traces. And within any particular run, you can pick three traces and set up criteria. And what you can do is say, in my example, I'm going to do coal first, then I'll come back and do, say, another rock type and, and see how does the new rock type merge with the existing rock type and build up a logical column for modeling and viewing. It does work in conjunction with the new domain manager. So you can actually even set up part of your problem using this tool and then use the domain manager to combine thin intervals or do quality cutoffs and all sorts of other things or use it directly. And we'll have a look at that. Anything you do pretty much in 
geology core you can undo and redo. And that includes database edits and even things like editing, cutting holes in triangulation surfaces or solids. All that stuff is available to you. So if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter, just undo it, fix it up, do it again. Uh, you can see the results happen in all the holes if you want to. And again, you can only work on the holes that you're interested in working on rather than the entire data set. So the domain manager. So if you've seen Richard's webinars, he would have talked about that in the um, context of setting up domains for implicit modeling and vein modeling. Fundamentally, it's the same process, but with a stratigraphic bent, um, you can bring in your existing coal seams run some stats on how many seams have how many intercepts, that kind of thing to see what the reliability, if you're bringing in qualities, see the qualities dynamically charted next to you for every horizon very easily and quickly. And as you change criteria for your domaining, how does that affect the stats? So you make sure you're not um, you know, skewing your statistics by doing things to it. And the, the other interesting addition I find, as I mentioned, is in addition to using it to work with existing logged uh, field, you can run directly off numeric values, either from downhole geophysics or within your database and set up, you know, quite complex um, criteria to define, say, rock types. So in this example, I've got a clay stone where the density is between 2.3, 2.6. The uh, gamma is less greater than 100 and the multi-channel sonic is less than 70. And that can be as simple or as complicated as you need. And then the order of these sets of priorities as to what overrides what. And you can very quickly build up a quite a comprehensive um, domain or rock type table suitable for the ongoing modeling you might want to do. Things like that aren't uh, stratigraphic you might want to model, like I said, strength, rock strength in say an um, overburden or a complex sort of uh, dike shape, things like that you can use our built-in implicit modeling tool. And again, as Richard mentioned in his webinar, it's a very powerful implicit modeling tool right out of the box you get as part of your maintenance. So it has full capability to uh, orient your modeling using ellipse control. You can make your ellipses from surfaces. You can you know, handcraft them to your, to your liking. It will, um, you can constrain the model from not ballooning out very easily. You can bring in additional attributed points, obviously from drill holes. You're modeling either grades or rock types, it's up to you. We also have things like two-sided lines called ribbons to help control problem areas. You can even bring in two-sided triangle surfaces and use that. So it is a fully featured implicit modeling tool out of the box. And with most stratigraphic clients these days, ultimately ending up in a heart model, which is a block model, the ability to make these sort of solids and then superimpose these into the block model with the stratigraphy is, is a very powerful tool. If it's something that's better modeled as a tabular feature, so rather than try and make a solid shape and like pizza dough and stretch it out incredibly thin, make a hanging wall and a foot wall. Okay? And it can work obviously horizontally, but all the way through to vertically. So as long as you're not scared by the idea of making a hanging wall and a foot wall, think roof and floor, this is a really great tool to have in the um, your, your arsenal to create solids, which you can then again superimpose you know, very, uh, very good models of your non-stratigraphic information into your stratigraphic model at the end. So getting into some add-ons, domain MCF, as I mentioned, you've got the, you know, the ribbon tool here, which it runs you through, bringing the data in, setting up your domains, extracting the attributed points, setting up your block model definitions, and then bang off you go to domain MCF and go and make your uh, domain MCF model, which will automatically be published in a download to Geology Core uh, and very soon some solids, as you saw. It's, it's a dedicated workflow. It allows you to do things in a stratigraphic sense. Like I said, the examples I've been using have been modeling, say, things in the bird or maybe even impurities within seams, right? where it's not necessarily a simple stratigraphic problem. Although, as can be seen in this example down here, which was done to do some gas modeling, all this correlation and modeling of the horizons is actually done automatically from the domain MCF engine. But in this instance, based on rock types created by using different trace values. So there was no correlation, even not even any geological logging involved in that process. It was just done straight from formula on your data to the machine learning engine back out into a geological model with, you know, in this case, some gas values and things. So there's a whole lot of, um, 
really interesting applications for the domain MCF tool. And the gateway to that tool is your Vulcan geology core model, sorry, package. So yeah, don't just think of it as being purely a stratigraphic thing. What's happening between the heat seams can be just as exciting and interesting as what's happening inside the seams. Another add-on is the seismic. So one of the you know, really great things from my point of view of having geology core available with every um, geomodeler and geostat modeler is there's now many, many platforms, if you like, to do add a simple add-on to. And seismic is one of the really useful ones. A lot of people have two or 3D segway data they're not really using in the modeling sense. So using geology core, you can just drag and drop them in, get them sorted out in terms of their color level and depth, um, you know, picks and things, and then either use it directly in geology core. There's some nice smart line tracing tools to pick up horizons, or if you're trying to pick up something like a break in between the horizons, obviously you can digitize off those, either 2D profiles, you can bring in 3D as well. And we offer you a tool that will take the point cloud that comes from a 3D seismic and quickly put it into a block model structure. And that gives you a volume all colored by the you know, amplitude of the seismic um, response. But that volume is something you can then slice and dice through at any angle with your drilling and models and you know things you brought in from say Vulcan pit designs or whatever else you happen to have available and start doing some digitization to improve your modeling down the track. And if you want to bring it back out to Vulcan, it's very simple. You can export the 2D as a textured triangulation automatically and the 3D is a block model which can be brought straight into the Vulcan block model. In a similar fashion, you know, have another place where you can add the geotech add-on this i'm talking more about the geotech as in what's in point studio currently so that is also available to add on to vulcan geology core and i guess the advantage having it in geology core is you have all your drilling and other geological information at your fingertips in that same interface all coordinated in the same space so you can really as i was sort of saying start bringing all the data from different sources together into geology core do what you need to do from a geological point of view and then you can either output the model directly in core or spit it out to something like to do further work on. Rightio, let's go and have a look at the software. So I'll just jump into here. Okay, so what I've got here is this Vulcan Geology Core. I've got a bunch of drill holes on the screen. We'll have a quick look at some of the visualization type tools. Um, so as you can see, currently I've got them loaded up with the seams labeled and rock types and the hole itself is displayed by horizon from the database. If I grab, say, a row of holes somewhere to have a look at in more detail, as I mentioned, I can grab a sub subset very easily. I'm just hitting control N on my screen here to bring those up in their own window. So I could do it with all the holes, but I can also just grab this subset and start changing the visualization of those holes. So I might say, well, rather than that, I want to do it as show the holes colored by lithotype. I'm going to use the label and uh, here I'm going to label it two meters. And this one here, I will make label and flag. And we'll see what that's all about. You can see currently I only have litho downhole survey and this new intervals table that was automatically generated. So I can put the whole names on if we want to change that. So very quickly, you can see now I have the holes colored by the rock types, but I've got this lovely label and flag of the horizons of the left hand side. Um, I can start doing things like um, including downhole geophysics. So what I might do is I'll come back into this area and let's bring some geophysics in. So let's jump out quickly to windows. And oh, excuse me for a sec. If I grab this window and say I want to look at it in terms of last files, I can grab all of those, select them, plonk. And the very first time they're coming in, it takes a little while to load. There are only 800 of them, uh, but then they're stored internally. And the beauty of this approach is you don't have to store this sort of information inside your ISIS database because that just bloats ISIS out. You know, you think all this information logged at every centimeter. Uh, if you're going to use it to try and create rock type analogies or even plotting and viewing and things, you don't have to put it into ISIS anymore. Keep your ISIS databases small and lean and, and much easier to use in, in Vulcan and other packages and just associate the last files with the actual drilling. Similarly, while we're here, we have some really cool tools to grab any downhole deviation information in last files and automatically 
resample that to make a new survey table. So again, rather than storing every centimetre, a depth and an azimuth and a dip, you know, and you've got a six metre long steel drilling rod that isn't going to be bending terribly much in one centimetre, resample it, chuck it in every one metre, get it to automatically make the national survey, and you're not bloating out your database with huge amounts of um, unnecessary information just to put a curvature on your hold. So once it's loaded it, you want to associate with the drill holes, and it has a smart association, so it's not just a direct match. It will handle slightly different names in the file names. It looks inside the last, the well fields, the location fields. So it's got a bit of logic there, and it it's usually gets it right most of the time straight out of the box. You can see what's associated with it. If it hasn't done it exactly how you want it, you can come in and override it using this associate geophysical log tool. But what that's done is, if I now select these holes and go to the visualization tool, it should now give me all the geophysical traces that I've got associated with those holes as well. But be aware, this has come not from the database, this has come from the last files. So let's have a look at the um, corrected density. So there, and you can have any number of traces. You can view them as traces, histograms, labels, whatever you like. I'm just gonna bring in as a trace and see what that looks like. So you can see here now I've got some nice looking geophysical traces and I can change the width and the legend to highlight things. I can flip them, smooth them, whatever I like. Um, now this is already logged, but imagine these holes weren't logged. Okay, so let's have a look at some of those tools. So if I grab those holes quickly and show you them in terms of not the seam logging, but the domain logging, which is currently pretty much empty, you can see what I'm talking about. So we've got, You've got the labels hanging off the edge, but the holes themselves aren't logged. This is just the coal labels. So that's when we can use something like the create intervals and downhole tool. So I can come in here, um, pick a hole, and then say, okay, I'm going to set the domain table to be coal. In this case, when, oops, I'll turn that off, and then we'll do it by depth, although you can. You can see now at a threshold of 50%, I'm starting to pick up some little coal intervals and I can change that, maybe slide it along a bit and see how that's picking up a few more intervals. Um, if it's getting a lot of chaff at the top here, I can say more, say the top 15 metres or whatever and clip that off. And fundamentally, I can use up to three traces in conjunction with each other and decide that is criteria for writing to coal. Um, and then I can basically say, terrific, let's publish that to that hole. So it's going to write new intervals in my hole. So you can start seeing my hole now, I'm picking up the coal and not logged. Now, the addition we did recently was I can then come back and say, in a simple example, everything that isn't coal is sandstone. So instead of being everything below, if I make that above and let that rip, you see it's filling in the existing, uh, the missing intervals with sandstone. If I hit apply on that, it's going to apply it. So we've got oh, lost our coal again. Let's quickly get the coal back. Gee. Ah, so you just bring this one in. Sorry. It's automatically picking up my depth for some reason. Um, so that's going to be below. We're going to merge with new intervals taking precedence with that rip. Okay. And so you start building up your coal logging and your sandstone logging. In, and keep on going, it might be tough, shale, whatever else you want to bring in with multiple passes. Now, the other way we can approach this is if I clear out that domain field, you can see all my new logging here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly empty that and do it again. So we can come in and manually change things, obviously, and split intervals and do all sorts of cool stuff. Okay. Um, excuse me. Try that one more time. Okay. So we can use the domain manager to do this instead. So you have a look at this. Um, so the first thing you might want to do is which hole or holes you want to use. So I'm just going to get rid of that and I'm going to drag this hole in. And then we can set up a domain name. And then I've got some simple uh, rules here, which I'm just going to quickly populate for you. So I've saved these previously, and they can be as simple or as complicated as you need.
Okay, and then I can run that on that hole and build up a you know a new lithological domain or rock type based on those simple rules. But these things can be as complicated as you need them to be. I can pick anything I've got in the geophysics. I can pick anything I've got in the database, be it text or numeric. Um, and I can add additional you know qualifiers for different things. Color has to be within a certain range, and the rock type has to be whatever. And then I can say, great, now when I get small intervals, I want to combine them by um, grade cutoff or by thickness or by distance into thicker intervals. I want to split them for the main MCF work. So again, each one of these rules can be very powerful in their own right and set up quite uh, complex conditions to define your lithological log. And then you apply these in the order for whatever holes you've selected. So again, it doesn't have to be for all the holes. And again, if you've made a mistake, you can do it all. Bang. See you later. Okay. The other quick one we've got, if I bring these into what's called correlation view. So if you just got the logging done and your correlation work done, I'm going to quickly uh, view those again by their seam name. So you have this really nice interface. I can bring in my uh, blog file legends. Can't put in there. And you'll see that all the different splitting arrangements and things are actually stored and kept. And so if we start looking at these correlations, uh, with any luck, we could see some of the horizons starting to join and split. So H16 is a good example. So you've got the D52 here, splitting into the D53 and the D17, um, and the splitting relationships representing that quite nicely. I can change this dynamically. So if I thought for some reason, I think this interval here is actually the uh, D52, which would probably be not a good thing. Let's make that, let's make this one D52. Yep, sorry. We go okay, so that's actually written it back to my database. You'll see the correlation automatically changes on the fly. So that gives you a bit of a visual cue that, hmm, maybe that's not correct. Again, the beauty of having it all stored in a backend SQL, you can bring it back again, fix it up. You can also use the dynamic editing tools. So I can grab an interval and say, well, I think I don't like compared to my geophysics, the thickness of that. So let's come and actually change this dynamically and the depths will change here dynamically, or I can type depths in here, either whichever way you want to go. And again, the correlations and everything change with you. So you can use it to sort of, um, you know, change individual holes very quickly. I can also do things like, okay, I think I've made a total mistake with the logging of this horizon D21 down here. So let's go and pick some of the holes, but not all of them. And I might use the freehand selection and grab all these ones, but just those ones. So I just pick a sub selection of the holes and I can say, okay, in the uh, litho seam table, I'm gonna call it um, states of sill where it used to be D21, apply that. And that will go and rewrite all the ones I've picked in one, one hit, right? So it's, again, you've got these really nice tools to re-correlate change themes on mass, but simply and visually, you can also do things, say I wanna align stuff on a particular horizon like the H21 rather than topo, then let's bring in the H21 and line it up by that. So structurally you can start playing with how intervals are changing uh, relative to the H21 being fixed. And you've got any number of labels and flags and things to bring all this information together and start using it for your detailed correlation work. Okay, in terms of, just quickly, I'm gonna have a look at the vein modeler. I'll just bring up a, oops, so bring up another data set for this. So here I've got a bunch of holes. And again, I've got this D52. So I'm going to change that. Select it and say, okay, we're going to do it backwards. Um, so that's going to be the scene, I think. Let's call that sill. Where what was currently D52. I wouldn't recommend totally blatting all your coal seams like this, but because we can. Okay. So that's gone and changed that to sill. 
So then we can take those holes and bring up under our modeling tab. Let's make a quick paint model. So grab those selected holes. Uh, we're going to model from litho seam. I can bring in my legends straight into here and pick which I want to model, which is sill, and say do a 10 meter sill model. Bang. Well, you've got one. I'll make it again. Now, this can be any orientation from horizontal to vertical, don't forget. So, what it does is it uses the implicit modeling radial basis function to pick the hanging wall and the foot wall and then combines them. You can add CAD control, you can uh, output points, you can, you know, uh, and make just the hanging wall or foot wall. So, you can actually use this to make fault planes as well. But you end up with a valid, closed, um, you know, triangulated solid in this case of that particular sill horizon. Now, the way the vein modeler works, oops, one was high, sorry, let's bring it back up again, um, buttons, is it will model through holes that don't have sill in it. It's just going to connect the ones it finds. So if you have a situation where, okay, I don't really want the sill to model it'd be existing in holes that don't actually have the sill in them, then that's where you might use something like the implicit model. The setup is quite similar, but you have all the ellipse control and things. And what you end up with is a different sort of result. Um, so something like this. So these are, it's, it's an it's a implicit model of the same uh, intercepts, but it only exists where the sill is actually bolted. It won't just model blindly through into uh, empty space. So you've got that either or way of approaching things. And, you know, obviously you'll know if it's better modeled as a solid, it's things like say a, a UCS inside a burden, that kind of thing, it might be better as an enclosed solid shapes, then obviously use your implicit modeling tool. If it's better modeled as a vein, some sort of vertical cross-cutting dike or something rather, then use it. But the beauty of it is you have these tools sitting in front of you, right? And obviously if you just want to make some grid models, I can grab these holes, again, I can grab all the holes here and pop them into this selection. Uh, probably not just the one hole, let's grab the entire database, sorry. And again, I've got my legend here, my seam splits, and behind it, you can see the grid it's modeling. So I can go and change simple things like modeling method and trending and point size and everything. But if I just let it rip, it's gonna make me a bunch of roots and floors. So for people who are just doing blast analysis, um, where you're coming in, getting some, say, drill rig telemetry, picking some coal seams based on downhole traces. Bang, want to make a quick model, throw that back out the blast logic and use that to predict your blasting for the next blast pattern, whatever. It's very quick, very easy. You don't have to be an instant strat modeling expert at all. You've just got the tools you need to make these nice simple models very fast. Okay. Finally, if I want to, say, grab this sill model and throw it out into Vulcan, then I can just say, yep, let's, let's put it out there and it will automatically... I'm uh, just using the export tool, or I could use the publish the Vulcan tool, whichever way you like to do it. Um, and that is now immediately available out here in Vulcan. So SIL2, I just made that a few seconds ago, it's now in the Vulcan interface. And what I've also got loaded here, if I quickly do a section along some boreholes is some 3D seismic. So we've brought it into geology core, done the analysis and tried it all up where we want it to be, made a block model of it, and then that block model is readily available in Vulcan. If that's where you want to do your work, you can see my new sill model sitting here. And it's in the course of the way we've optimized dealing with um, large regular block models, the performance and everything is really nice. I can come in and digitize in Vulcan if that's my preferred environment, or obviously do it in Geology Core and then do the modeling in whatever package is most appropriate. You have them available to use. So that is a very quick overview of uh, <laughs> the stratigraphic components, if you like, of geology core. And I'll um, jump back to the presentation quickly. So the last thing I think Richard's already mentioned this in his previous webinars is how do you get access to it? Well, if you've got a maintained geo model, or geostat model, you've got access to it already, part of your maintenance still, you're welcome. Um, to license it, we're using the MapTech account. So doesn't mean your Vulcan has to be done by MapTech account. They can stay how it is now, but if you want to start Geology Core, you need to sign up for MapTech account. Very simple process. You'll already be pre-authorized. You then go to the MapTech account page and download it, or you can even do it from the um, download manager on, this, on the um, workbench. And then basically you're off and running. Start up Vulcan, go to the Geology menu, hit Geology Core and follow the prompts. There's really nice help. There's all sorts of wonderful things we've got there to guide you along the process. And of course, 
talk to your role and support people if you do get stuck or have any questions. But um, speaking of questions, I might throw it to the floor now and try and answer any you've come up with. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Pete, for a great run through of some really useful tools for stratigraphic modeling with bulk and geology core. Um, some great questions have come through, but I do realize that some people have had audio issues. So if you didn't hear all of it, we'll get that recording out um, as soon as possible. To kick off with questions, uh, I've got a question about using this with the integrated stratigraphic modeling workflow. Um, so if I'm happy with that modeling workflow, how does this fit in? Is it an add or or does it form part of that um, workflow in Vulcan? Yeah, it can probably come in at, at both ends of your Vulcan's integrated strat modeling workflow. So in initial process of, of ensuring that your input data is correctly correlated and checked, um, you can visually use those correlation tools. If you're bringing in brand new holes that only have, say, some downhole geophysical logging and you want to quickly log the coal intervals in, in that example and correlate them, then use the tools to do that and check them against your existing logging. And so you, you can update or make sure that your input model before you start doing anything in Vulcan is as accurate and makes as much sense as possible. And then at the other end, when you might be modeling things like dikes and faults and things that cross cut your stratigraphy and you want to get so, you know, solids of those things and superimpose them into say a resultant uh, harp stratigraphic block model, Again, Geology Core has the ideal tools in it, as you saw with the vein and implicit modeling to make those solids easily for you without any need to digitize lots of polygons and things and create those solids, have them immediately available in Vulcan to then use in, in your ongoing processes with your heart model, for example. Thanks for that. Another question that came through was about um, more of these Vulcan data types. So I saw you bring in drill holes and blob files. My other stratigraphic files like grids, can I bring them in? Um, as well. Yeah, certainly. I should have shown that. But yeah, any any grid files can be brought straight in, be they quality or structural. Um, block models can come straight in. Drilling, we've already talked about, obviously, triangulation models. So if you have pit designs, pit layouts, if you have Vulcan CAD, that can be brought in as a live link. So any changes you make in either package will be reflected in both. Um, and it also, Geology Core has a lot of, it, it started life as an exploration package. So if you have multi-attributed data, such as, I don't know, gravity or magnetics and things you want to bring in, or even say soil sampling or something, you can throw that into the Geology Core interface very easily and it handles multiple, you know, 10, 20 attributed ASCII files very nicely as well. So you have that additional flexibility. Excellent. Um, question about the domain manager. Are you able to save your domain manager specifications for sharing and ongoing utilization? Um, yeah, they get chucked out. Um, so let me just quickly jump into to the software. So what happens is your domain rules, if you like, get stored as um, objects in the domain manager uh, container here. And those ones can be actually exported to something like a, a MapTech, what's called a MapTech OBJ format, which is like our internal format that you can share with other people using Geology Core directly. So you can certainly select those rules and share them amongst your friends using that format, just dump them out. And you can select you know, multiple things and they'll spit out as individual MapTech OG, OBJs for you. If you know a better way, Richard, let me know. <laughs> no, that, that certainly works. We're certainly um, continuing development on that to try and make it more site-wide um, corporate standard, if, you're, if you will, from the Vulcan sort of way of doing things where we can present companies with a, a, a set of rules that everyone um, uses without them having individual copies. So we're still carrying on work on that. Yep. With implicit modeling, there's a question here about complex structures and can overturn, uh, overturn fold limbs be represented? Yeah, look, certainly the implicit model can, can, can make solids that fold back on themselves. So there's no problem with that. Um, whether it, out of the, you know, straight out of the box, it actually creates an overturn. You'd have to give it the data and some orientation and see what it does. If it doesn't, that's when you might try and use something uh, like some control uh, ribbons where you can give it a little bit of CAD assistance and sort of say, well, you know, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make an overturn fold hinge or, or line and the inside is this side and the outside is this side and throw that into your modeling mix. But uh, certainly in terms of the actual base method of the radial basis function, it's, it's happy to do overturns and all sorts of uh, wonderful shapes for you. So that shouldn't be a problem. 
Excellent. Well, this is our, our last call for questions. So if you've got any more fire in the box uh, before I finish, finish up. But also remember that um, make sure you contact myself, Pete, or any of your local map tech um, team to if you have any more questions about how you can really integrate this in your workflow. It looks like that's the end of our question. So uh, thanks, Pete. No problem. One last thing I forgot to mention was all this, all these tools are integrated with your workflow tool on your workbench here. So to the extent of you can actually bring up the parameters within each of the options and uh, set up entire processes and automate them quite easily. So keep that in mind too. But otherwise, yes, thanks for your time. And as Richard said, any questions, please get in touch.